Hey guys, I know it's been a minute, but praise the Lord. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You guys, I have a very heavy word to give to you today. This does not come from a place of condemnation. I want you to know that first and foremost, but this is a warning. This is a warning to believers in Christ Jesus. I want you to take this word and I want you to pray and I want you to ask for discernment always. Never take my word for it. I am just a willing vessel being used and a messenger of the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to pray over this word. I have been kind of wrestling with it. I have over 20 pages of notes, okay? But I am not going to go through each note, um, but I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me. And if I have to go to some of my notes, then I will. But I'm giving God all the glory, the honor, and the praise for everything that he has shown me and told me over this time that I have taken a break. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father God, first for your word, Father God, because it does not return void, Lord. I pray, Father God, that your word would always be known as a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path, because that is what it is, Father God. You are the chief cornerstone. You are in whom I put my trust, Father God. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I pray, Father God, that you would hide me under the shadow of your wings today, Father God, as I give this heavy word, Lord. And I pray, Father God, that it would touch many hearts and many minds, Lord Jesus. And I pray that they would come to know you today if they don't know you, or they would, they would repent, Father God. And they would turn from wickedness, Father God. And I pray that eyes would be open and ears would be open in tune with you today, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for what you show us ahead of time, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for everything that you have done in and through my life, Lord, and will continue to do. Please forgive me where I fail you, Lord. Please give me a pure heart and clean hands, Father God. I do not come with this word, Father God, with a speck in my eye, Father God. I have walked through the, the pruning, through the pressure. The, pressure, the, the crushing, the, the, the pressure, the persecution, everything, Father God. And I do not speak this word lightly, Lord. You know, Father God, in my flesh I am not able to even speak these things. But it is by your Holy Spirit, and I thank you. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and lead today. I love you, Father God, and I praise your holy name for everything that you do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, guys. Like, I'm already feeling the Holy Spirit. I'm already wanting to come to tears. But I got to get through this video. All right. So we're going to start in Acts 2, 42 through 46. And this is what the word says. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what am I talking about now? I am talking about the New Testament church. I am talking about the body of believers that would come together and they would break bread together. They would read the word of God together. They lived life together. They were there for one another. They, they helped one, one, one another out. You know, they were being the church. We have to understand that the word church in this Bible, in this holy word of God, the truth that does not return void, Isaiah 55, 11, his word that does not return void, the sword, right? The sword, it teaches us all things and it clearly shows us what the word church means. The word church is ecclesia. It means called out ones. So my question to you today is, will the real Ecclesia please stand up? Because we have lost our way 
and it goes back to the history of the church. If we are going according to the word of God, we have to understand that we, as the body of believers in Christ, are the church. It's not a place that you get up and go to. It's a who you are. We are a people. We, the kingdom, together. Now we have to understand that there has been a lot of witchcraft and deception that has been crept in since the beginning of time. But it all started literally with the building of the brick and mortar churches. The Lord has shown me several dreams of late, showing me the masonry, showing me Freemasons to tie that in, showing me the paganism that is tied to the building churches. And like I said today, this is not condemnation and I do not come you guys, seriously, this is a heavy word. I do not come to you in condemnation. I come to you to warn you of the deception so that your eyes can be open and you can truly be set free today because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And Jesus wants to set you free. And he wants you to return back to the word of God, to have the full understanding about what it means to be the church. It's not a building. And Throughout the years, the traditions of men, the religion that has come in, has destroyed this, what, what people perceive as the meaning of church. I live in the South, so one of the main things is, is, is if you go out in town and you haven't seen somebody in a long time, the first thing that they ask you is, where do you go to church? Because we have been brainwashed into believing these things that are deceiving. They are deceiving. All right? It's the doctrine of demons. The devil has infiltrated the building churches. There is so much corruption. He has shown me the demons that are behind that. And we're going to get through that. And I've been sounding the alarm for years and years and years and years and years on this. But I'm here today to tell you that you have got to have your eyes open and your ears open to understand that that building is not the church. It all started back in the history. Did you know that the building of the churches go back to paganism and the building of the temples? Based off the plan of the pagan Roman Basilica or Hall of Justice, that is how the brick and mortar churches were designed. Then later designed a transept was added to form a wing aligned perpendicular to the nave to form the Latin cross or cruciform and auxiliary altars dedicated to the saints. Basilica means king. So Christian architects adapted the pagan plan, installing an altar near the large rounded recess where the king or judge sat. Constantine didn't destroy all temples, but many Christians came in and built churches inside of pagan temples. We have to understand that this building was created from paganism. That is a giant bomb that I am dropping today. This is the truth in love, you guys. In the beginning of the Bible, people met in homes. Acts 2, 46, 2 42 through 46, 5 and 42, Romans 16 and 5, 1 Corinthians 16 and 19. I want you guys to read those on your own. Jesus nor the apostles ever said anything about meeting in a building. Ever. Because Jesus came and he tore the veil. Because before that, 
the the high, the high priest, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees, only the high priest could go inside of the Holy of Holies. They had a rope tied to them. If they had any sin in them and they died, you know, they had to be drug out. But when Jesus died on that cross, he tore the veil. So then we don't have to go anywhere to receive him. It's a free gift of salvation through the work of the cross, through his sacrifice. We are called to repent of our sins, to turn from our wickedness, to look upon the Lord, to believe fully in him as the Lord of our life. He washes us clean. His blood that was shed on the cross washes us clean. We repent, we believe, and we live. We walk according to his word. Mark 1 and 15. You have to get this concept today that whatever goes on in that building is not the end. The enemy has come in and, and destroyed and distorted everything. So much so that believers in Christ have stopped reading the word of God and they just listen to the person that is, is literally worshipped inside of those buildings. Your pastor, your bishop, your, your whatever. People have replaced them with Jesus. And it's the same that goes back to the temples, just like the Temple of Diana in Ephesus. All right? You can look these things up. The Temple of Diana in Ephesus. All right? That goddess was literally raised up high. And people would come in to that sanctuary, to that altar, and worship, and lay down and worship that idol. How many are doing the same in building churches today? How many are coming into that congregation, coming together in that congregation, building up that pastor, building up that bishop, building up that prophet, building up that apostle, whatever it may be, building that person up so much so that you live and breathe every single word that they say, but you never, ever, ever, ever question or challenge or pick up this yourself. You never look to see, oh gosh, am I being deceived? I'm going to take you to the scripture that the Lord showed me in a dream. The other night I was, I was in a dream and I was preaching. I was preaching um, in this congregation and I call on people and I'm like, can you read this scripture? Can you read this scripture? And they're like, no, 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 I can't, I can't read that. I don't, I don't know how to read the Bible. I, I don't, I don't do that, you know? And then I go to the back row and there's this little child sitting there with their Bible, holding their little Bible. And there, I flip through the pages and it's all pictures and there's biblical characters. And then it starts to go to deception. It starts showing Christmas ornaments and all this stuff in place, showing me the traditions showing me traditions of men, showing me deception. And this is the this is the scripture that I was teaching on, the scriptures, this chapter that I was teaching on in this dream. And I'm going to read it now. It's 1 Timothy 4. Please get out your Bibles and read with me. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose con consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. But those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this, we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all men and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which has was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders lay their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I hope you hear what Paul is saying, but also what the Lord was saying to me. We are called to walk and to worship in spirit and in truth. Let's go to John 4 and 23. And I'm already off my notes, but praise be unto the Lord. I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. Or is it John 2? Let's see. John 4, 21. Jesus declares, and he's talking to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. He says, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor are in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus came, so then we are able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Where two or more are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. It may just be you and the Lord in the secret place for the longest time until he sends another believer beside you to congregate with you to so you to share you know what the lord has given you it may be in your home that you are called to lead and guide and talk about things of the lord you're you're called to be used in your workplace or at school wherever you go we are called to be prepared in season and out of season and how beautiful are the feet of those that carry the gospel we are called you guys we are called as the temple as the ecclesia you are the temple you are the temple that building is not the temple jesus nor the apostles encouraged christians to christians to build temples or church buildings when we build temples we build idols it's the same as the temple of Diana. I'm telling you straight from what the Lord has shown me. It is a gateway to idolatry. Because literally in that dream where I was preaching this to the congregation. And they didn't want to read the Bible. They didn't understand the Bible. And the deception that was shown. And then off to the right, the Lord showed me the spirit of Jezebel. And how that has crept in. And I've told you guys this a thousand times and I'm going to say it again. And she has literally caused people to eat the food sacrifice to idols. When we literally walk into those buildings and we believe, when we believe that this space is the only thing that is sacred and we do not walk outside of those doors and be the church, that is like putting God in a box. That is exactly what is happening. You worship him on that day, in that space, but then you don't bring him home with you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's literally like he is a genie in a bottle and you just rub him and you just pray to him and Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. It's all about me. It's all about this, but only this can happen in these four walls. And you don't continue to walk it out. You, you don't go forth in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, 16 through 20, actually. You don't go forth and make disciples. You literally become just a pew warmer. We are not called to come together and sit and soak. We are called to come together to edify each other. 
And before you get on Hebrews 10 and 25 about forsaking gathering together, I'm going to go to that. But let's look at some more history here. Constantine and his succeeding Roman emperors made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That Christians began to then build temples. Christians, with the help of the Roman soldiers, took over pagan temples and Christianized them into churches. Do you see how the deception has literally crept in? Not only that, most of the denominations that have been created, their leaders were Freemasons. And don't even let me get started on the witchcraft and deception of the most oldest fraternal organization in the entire world, the Freemasons. You can look up all of the um, deception and wickedness because I have so many notes on it. It would literally take me days to talk about all that. But there is so much witchcraft and so much deception and occultism that is tied into that secret society. Okay? You have to understand that. But I'm laying the foundation of the brick and mortar churches to help you understand it is no different than you walking up into the temple of Diana and giving worship. It's no difference because of the fact that they went in, like I said, they had their little orgies, they had a little time of idol. Da -da 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 -da. We did church, we got our check mark for the week. Woohoo, we did it, we did it, yay, yay. But then they went around, they went the you know the rest of the day not even thinking about what was going on in that temple. You have to understand, you are the temple. It's not a place that you go. You are the body of believers. We are the body. But what has caused so much division? For one, denominations, and they're literally man-made, you guys. I do not read Reading this over and over and over and over and over and studying so many years of this word, I have not read one thing about denominations. They are man-made. How can we have unity in the body of Christ when there's so many different opinions and so many different denominations? We are to follow the word of God, not denominations. Okay? Hope that you're getting that today. Then people began to think of a church building as a sacred space. This caused people the deception to focus more on what happens inside the building. Instead of what happens, it's kind of like what happens in the church building stays in the church building. Have you ever heard that? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's kind of like that in the church world too. What happens in this church building stays here. And then the focus itself is not on the outside what's going on but what's on the inside being the means and understanding of what church is as the bible clearly states the ecclesia is the called out ones it's not pew warmers it's not for you to just come in soak it up listen you know, what does James 1, 22 through 25 tell us? We can't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We have to walk in obedience. So if you're just going to that building and you are not being the church on the outside, then you are in rebellion. You need to repent. You are in rebellion because you're completely going against what the Lord says. You have to walk in obedience according to his name. You cannot just be a hearer of his word. You have to be a doer of his word. This has caused many to forget that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. And he has called everyone to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Let's go there very quickly. I hope that you are carrying on with me. Please hold on with me, please. Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We are to walk as Jesus walked, as in First John. Mark tells us, you know, we are to go out 
and lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. We are to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Matthew 21 and 13 says, Twenty one through thirteen. Twenty one and thirteen says, It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is when Jesus I'm gonna I'm gonna start in twelve. Then Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers robbers the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them but when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouted in the temple area hosanna to the son of david they were indignant do you hear what these children are saying they asked him yes replied jesus have you ever read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise and he left them and went out of the city of bethany where he spent the night do you hear what this is saying? Jesus came into the temples and flipped the tables. I pray today that he is flipping some tables in your life, that you are, he is flipping your mindset, that you are finally, the blinders are finally flipped off and you can finally see the truth today. He says that his house will be called a house of prayer. Our house, our home is our heart. It is to be a house of prayer because we are the temple. We are the temple. What does he need to drive out today? Because he is cleaning house. He is cleaning house. He is setting a warning today for you to understand that if you are walking into that brick and mortar house, house of the Lord, and you have made that a sacred space and only the Lord can do things in there. And not only that, the leaders oftentimes control when the Holy Spirit can break out and when he can't. Can I get an amen? That is the truth because there's so much deception and so much witchcraft. The Lord has shown me a lot of demons that are behind this. One was the Jezebel. Next is the Antichrist spirit that's tied in with counterfeit, with counterfeit um, false signs and wonders. And it all stems from Leviathan. It all stems from pride, the pride of money. All right, let's go to Matthew 6. A friend spoke this to me today and it went right with it. Let's go to 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one or love the, and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you hear me today? In these brick and mortar churches, one of the deceptions is money. They are ruled by power and money. It is a counterfeit. They have people so enslaved in that thought process of you got to pay that 10%. And if you don't pay that 10%, you're not going to be healed. You're not going to be set free. You're not going to be delivered, blah, 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 blah. Do you know that Jesus came and abolished the law? Do you know that you are not bound by that 10% anymore? In the New Testament, it tells us that we are to be cheerful givers. We give out of our heart because Jesus gave it all for us. Why would we not want to give? But you're not bound by that 10% anymore. You're not bound by that tithe anymore. You're no longer a slave to the law. Do you hear me today? You're no longer slave to religion like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But if you are in a church that has literally programmed you into believing these lies and wickedness, I'm here to tell you today that they are bound by the spirit of the Antichrist and Leviathan. And you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. Jesus said, make me a house of prayer. My, my, my house is to be a house of prayer. The altar is our heart, you guys. Who do 
do you bow to? Are you bowing to that leader? Are you so worried about not being in that building so much so that it's put, it's literally enslaved you. It's put a yoke on you because you're like, I've got to be in that building. I've got to be in that building. If I'm not in that building, I'm forsaking the, 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 how, you know, I'm forsaking gathering together. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 25. Let's go ahead and go there. I've got so many scriptures on this. Hebrews 10 and 25. Hebrews 10 and 25, actually 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we must spear one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Continue reading. Don't stop reading. See, that's the problem when people cherry pick scripture. They're just like, oh, this is what this means. But they don't read the before and they don't read the after. So then they don't fully get the context of what the Lord is saying. In 26, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fear, fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to to insult and persecution at all times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the um, confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be greatly, richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done this, the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. What he's talking about, this is a call of perseverance. This is a call to continue the journey. This is a call to don't forsake yourselves coming together and encouraging one another as the body of believers. It's not saying that you got to go to that church and come together. It's saying come together with other believers. Come together and encourage one another. Build each other up. The body of Christ. Not just you and your little clique in, in, in your church. Because that is actually, cliques and factions are actually part of the sinful nature in Galatians 5, 16 through 25 that actually say that we'll not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is the deception, you guys. There's so much deception. Let's go to Hebrews 3 and 13. The devil, the father of all lies, John 8 and 22, has come in and deceived so many people. I want you to hear the truth today. Hebrews 3 and 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So this is saying, come together and encourage each other every day, wherever you are. Encourage everyone. Encourage them with the good news of the gospel, telling them to, to turn to Jesus and, and repent of their sins. Encouraging you to finish this race well. You know, telling them, you can't be doing that. You can't be doing this. You know, turn away from that wickedness. Encouraging the body. 1 Thessalonians 5. You know when you literally start like turning pages and you're like, I know where that is in the Bible. And then your your Bible just wants to like kind of go all together and then they stick together. All right. Five and, five and 11. 
1 Thessalonians 5 and 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. That is what Hebrews 10 and 25 is talking about. Coming together as the body of Christ. So let's go to 1 Corinthians. I've got a lot of scripture here today, guys, but this is the stuff that the Lord has been showing me. This is where he has been leading me. And just for you to understand what it truly means to be the church. It's not running to that building. You are called to be the church. 1 Corinthians 12 and 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do, do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And no, I will show you the most excellent way. He is telling us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, starting that there is one body, but it has many parts. He's talking about the body of believers. He's talking about the kingdom, being kingdom united together, that we all have different parts. We all have different callings. But when we come together in unity together, that's how the body is to function. But it's not talking about in your so-called area only. It's about the believers all over the world coming together. All right? It is about all of us in the body coming together and encouraging one another. It's not about this denominational law and this church, you know, what we believe is right and what you believe is not right. It's about the Bible, getting back to the basics and reading your word yourself. You cannot obey God if you do not read his word because you do not know him. You cannot know somebody that, that you haven't found anything about. How can you become in a relationship with somebody if you don't know nothing about them? How? You can't. So you cannot tell me that you have a true loving relationship with Jesus Christ if you do not read his word. If you do not meditate on it day and night and night and day and put it away in your heart. If this was taken away today, how much, how much would you know of the word? That's a scary thought. It's a dangerous place to be in. It's very dangerous. You've got to wake up today and start being the church and get out of the mindset of it's a place that you go. It's a people you are. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, just like I said, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I don't belong to the body, I would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? And it is, there are many parts, but one body. The body of believers. Let's go to Romans 12 and 5 now. And I will have all of these scriptures linked. Romans 12 and 5. And it says, So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to to all the others. Six, we have different gifts according to the grace given. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it to the proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is con contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern dil diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You guys, we have to get back to the word of God. This is one of the best scriptures ever right here. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I, I urge you, brothers, 
in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is the spiritual act of worship. This is the spiritual act of worship, of worshiping Jesus in spirit and in truth. We are to lay our lives down as living sacrifices to be used however the Lord sees fit for us to be used. Because he has a purpose and a plan for you, but you must seek him to find him when you seek him with your whole heart. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that's what I want you to pray over yourself today. Pray, and I pray for you. Do not be conformed to the ways of this world any longer. The ways of this world are the tradition. The ways of the world are, are that, that, those pagan underlays, those stones that were made for those brick and mortar churches. That's not the stones that Christ says that his church is built on. Matthew 16 and 18 says, Upon this rock I will build my church. He's talking to Peter. And he's talking about people. Why do you think Peter's name means rock? It, you know, when, when, when that storm came and, and Jesus called out to the disciples in that boat and Peter stands up and he comes and walks on the water. You know, Jesus was there with Peter. And when Peter had his eyes on Jesus, you know, we are to walk as Jesus walked, to, to look as Jesus looked because of the fact that we put on his righteousness, right? So when people see us, they're not to see us, they're to see Jesus in us because we are to be that light of the world, the city on the hill, Right? We shine Jesus. It's not of us. It's of Jesus that's in us. So when Peter literally looked at Jesus, he wasn't even focused on walking on that water. He just walked on the water. But as soon as Peter looked to that world, I'm paraphrasing, of course, looked to the world, he started to sink. But guess who was there to pick him right back up? Do you understand why he said, Peter, rock, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's saying, Peter, look at me, the solid rock, the foundation, the chief cornerstone that was rejected. Do you get it? Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but he is still being rejected and being replaced by these stones that people have built up. These walls that people have built up with the mindset, their mindset has been transformed into conforming to the world's ways, to the traditions of men. And it all stemmed from paganism. Thank you, Jesus. We have to understand that we are the temple. We are carriers of God's glory. Romans 8 and 11, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and me. The New Testament describes people meeting in homes, Acts 2, 44 through 46. The mindset of the building is unbiblical because the father of all lies has deceived many into believing that if you aren't in that building, you aren't worshiping God or you aren't a part of the church. There is truly no difference in the temple of Diana and Ephesus worshiping a pagan goddess than there is with the culture of the belief that what many describe as the church. There's also no difference in the Pharisees and the Sadducees when it's supposed to be all about the kingdom. How can we be in unity in one body when there are thousands of denominations? The answer is we can't. The answer is denominations are man-made. The answer is this mindset creates religion and not relationship. And a friend of mine also, you know, um, explained to me also in that, that it's not just about relationship with Jesus, but it makes distorted relationships with other believers because of the fact that if you believe something different than me, like the world tells us that we're enemies and we're not to be conjoined together, but we believe in the same Jesus. I tell people all the time, yeah, you may see things different than me, than me but we believe in the same Jesus. We love the same Jesus. I love you. I love you just the same. If you agree with me or not, I still love you. Right, And I'm not here to argue anything, but I am here to hear, to speak the truth in love and tell you what the word says. And also as a messenger of the Lord to relay his message with trembling. Like I said, this is not easy. This is not, oh my goodness, like 
puff me up. Absolutely not. This is not easy to come on here and speak the word in truth. But I know who I am. I know who the Lord has made me to be. And I know what I'm called to do. And when he drops these bombs and he says, you better make a video now, you do it. Right? You have to walk in obedience. And that's not to puff me up at all, you guys. It's not about me at all. It's not about me. It's about Jesus receiving the glory and eyes being open and ears being open. The belief, the beliefs that are attached to the building are unbiblical. And it's time to get back to the word of God. Jesus came to abolish. And he did. He did away with the law. He destroyed the space between by tearing the veil. When he was crucified on that cross, offering a free gift of salvation to anyone who believes, repents, and lives. Like I already said, Mark 1 and 15. So how can we be united as the kingdom? Let's go to John 2 and 16. How can we be united when there's so much division? It says, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? So this is what has happened. This is what has happened. Literally. The enemy has come in. He has sent in his demonic spirits. The doors have been opened to them. And it has destroyed what church means. It has destroyed many believers and their beliefs. It has destroyed many people's relationship with the Lord because of the fact of what has rose up so quickly. And that is temple worship. Like, it, it, I don't know how else to explain it besides, you know, the, the witchcraft, the symbols, the rituals, the things that have, that have been brought in. It's, it's so deceiving. It has caused, you know, people since the foundations of America to be found, you know, in God we trust, but then these things to be built up and then these denominations to be built up. And it's like, oh, well, this person started arguing with this person. So we decided to make this church. You see what I'm saying? Instead of going back to the simplicity of what the word of God says to worship in spirit and in truth, they gathered in homes. They lived life together. How many people can you truly say that you can look at right now? that are in your building churches and you know for a fact that they are living life with you, that they are building a true relationship with you, that they are encouraging you, pushing you along the way, all of those type things. You have to truly look and, and see what you are getting out of this. You have to truly look and see and, and check yourself. Check yourself with the whole reason. Are you going because you just believe you have to be in that church? Are you going because it's that can't forsake your, you know, coming together? Are you going because that's just what you do? Like, what is the reasoning? And has anything crept in that is unbiblical? Has anything crept in that I've talked about before? The deceptions. If it's crept in, then you need to repent. And you need to ask the Lord what your next step is. I pray that he would give you eyes to see and ears to hear. You know that Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says that not everybody is going to inherit the kingdom of God. We are called to expose Ephesians 5, 11 through 14. So then repentance can come. God's judgment will fall on you if you don't repent of all the deception. And, and maybe it's even innocent. That's what I'm saying. Like a lot of times it's completely innocent. You're, you're, you're just doing what you've always done. But maybe you didn't understand the history behind it. Maybe you didn't understand the biblical scriptures behind what church actually means. So many of the children of God are deceived. They've been deceived by the doctrine of demons. They've been, you know, deceived by the traditions of men. They've been deceived into believing all these things because they're just hearers and they're not doers of the word. Because a lot of people do not eat the scroll. They do not eat the word of God for themselves. And you guys, I take this very, very seriously, as I said beforehand. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. 
I want you guys to understand, I take that very seriously. I take what Paul says there very seriously. The apostasy is happening now, you guys. How much more deceitful is it to believe that you can be a part of this anti-Christ agenda and be a church leader? Beyond any religious context, the building of this great structure provides a symbolic foundation for the process of self-development. And a lot of this basis of the building church is for self-development. It's where you are self-developed. You know, when we are to read the word ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to be our God. Not saying that you aren't to have a leader in your in your life teaching you and discipling you and all those type things. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that whatever you're being taught you have to read for yourself and you have to allow the Holy Spirit to convict you and, and teach you and guide you in all ways. Not that you don't go to those leaders and for wisdom and, and all those things. Absolutely. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that the whole process of everything is unbiblical. I'm saying the deception that has crept in and people forget that God is omnipresent, that he is everywhere, and that you are the church. Everywhere that you go, you're representing the church because you are a body, a body part in the body of Christ. It's not a place that you go. It's not a place that you just go on a Sunday, go on a Wednesday. It's a person, it's a people that you are. You are a part of the kingdom. We have to understand the structure, the things that have been built up Has caused grave deception. How many people argue all the time over the interpretation of Scripture? Right? When when the Lord shows you something, you are to pray over it. Pray over it. Test it. Test every spirit. Test every spirit now. Test the spirits. First John tells us to do so. First Timothy 2, 23 through 26. And it says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct and in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. This is the scripture that I want to leave you guys with today. Has the enemy entrapped you? As in Amos 8, it says a basket of fruit, talking about the devil's snare. Snare, sorry. Has the devil entrapped you in his snare? Has he entrapped you into believing the traditions of men? Into believing that you're all good as long as you have that check mark, as long as you're in that building, as long as you are going and doing every single thing that, that somebody else tells you to do but you're not reading the word yourself. You don't truly have a relationship with Jesus. It's just based off religion. It's just based off being in that building. It's just based off, oh, I went and did it, and then the whole rest of the week, you don't pick up your Bible, you have nothing to do with the Lord, you're not seeking him. You see what I'm saying? Like there's just so much deception. And I could go on and on and on about dreams that the Lord has given me, words that the Lord has given me. But we can no longer prostitute ourselves to these things because that's exactly what it's doing. It's creating idolatry. When you hold something at such a higher standard than Jesus, you are idolizing it. If you idolize that church, because like I said, so many people, they want to ask that question. Where do you go to church? Who is your pastor? When we are the church and Jesus is the head. I love you guys, and I hope that you have a blessed and wonderful day. And I hope and pray that this has encouraged you today. Like I said, no condemnation at all. This is a very heavy word, but I had to release it. I pray that you will read these scriptures. I'm going to put them in the description box, and I pray that you would pray for discernment. Have a blessed and wonderful day. Bye-bye.